years ago, um, people were asking the same kinds of questions about Georgia and about the post-Soviet region uh, that they're now asking about the Middle East. Um, when you see the questions that are being asked about the Arab Spring, does this mean democratization being brought to a region long uh, afflicted with authoritarian forms of governance? Uh, the same kind of questions were being asked 10 years ago when uh, the Rose Revolution occurred uh, in Georgia and when uh, the uh, Shepard Nancy presidency, which had tried to uh, rig elections to stay in power, um, when, when these uh, elections brought people onto the streets and seemed to open a window to democratization. And therefore, when we look at these parliamentary elections which have just occurred, uh, and people are you know, saying the same things again, does this mean democracy finally uh, in Georgia? Um, it's, it's good to try and see where Georgia has come from in the last 10 years, and then to ask ourselves where perhaps uh, is it going? I think the historian in me would like to highlight there's a, there's a certain cyclical nature to Georgian history, and I'll just move on to the, the first slide here. Uh, yeah, the cyclical pattern uh, to the history of independent Georgia. Um, when Georgia was trying to get independent from the Soviet Union, um, a man, Gamze Kordia, Zviad Gamze Kordia, became president. Uh, and he was considered pro-Western, simply because to be anti-communist at the time was considered to be synonymous with pro-Western. Uh, he also turned out to be very authoritarian and quickly became unpopular and was overthrown in a violent uh, coup d'etat. Um, but Georgia was uh, recognized slightly, shortly after this, and uh, Shevard Nadze came to the helm also considered pro-Western, was very popular, particularly in Germany, the man who facilitated the reunification of Germany, um, and for a time brought reforms, brought stability, but ultimately again became unpopular, <coughs> became increasingly authoritarian, and was overthrown uh, in a relatively peaceful um, uh, event, uh, which I've already referred to, the Rose Revolution. Uh, then we have Saakashvili, his replacement, also considered pro-Western, um, you know, a poster boy of reform. Um, his cabinet is made up of young, very young sometimes. They had a 27-year-old minister for defense, uh, Western-educated, uh, with, with, um, with a very strong geopolitical orientation towards the West. Um, and now we see his he's, he's being replaced. Um, and every time that Georgia has these changes, uh, they move a little bit forward, um, and, and uh, there's a little bit more progress. I mean, certainly if you look over the 20 years, it's good that these parliamentary elections took place peacefully. There was a peaceful transfer of government. It's a huge step forward from previous changes. Uh, however, there remain many challenges, and I will be referring to these uh, throughout this uh, brief uh, talk. Um, just firstly, the Rose Revolution itself and the, the character of the Saakashvili presidency. These were young men in a hurry who really believed that they had brought about and were embarking upon a new epoch uh, in Georgian history, uh, that 2003 was year zero and they were going to inaugurate uh, an economic, a political, a social, a moral, a mental transformation uh, of Georgia. Uh, even the fact that uh, Saakashvili chose the, um, the burial place of David the Builder, the last great monarch of Georgia who had brought Georgia to unprecedented heights in terms of prosperity and territorial uh, size, uh, that he had the inauguration there. He was more or less making a pledge that I will return Georgia to its great period. I will unite the territories that have been lost within my presidential term, uh, which of course didn't make uh, conflict resolution efforts easy when you start saying that it's personified in a way, it's, it's connected with your presidency. Um, the UNM flag, the United National Movement flag of which Saakashvili was head, became the national flag. Um, EU flags proliferated. Uh, you, you, anybody who visits Tbilisi sometimes might be forgiven for mistaking that it's not a member of the European Union. So great are the volume of flags uh, that, that are there. And every time you saw Saakashvili giving a ministerial address, or rather a presidential address, always the EU flag was behind him. Um, he did enjoy widespread popularity at the beginning. There's no question there. He, he, he won the presidential elections with 96% of the vote, which was kind of Central Asian and a little bit worrying, perhaps. It tells you something about the bandwagoning nature of the Georgian electorate. Uh, in the parliamentary elections of 2003, the ones that uh, Shepard Nancy tried to rig, uh, he, his party got 25%. But once it became clear that he was, he was the victor, Shepard Nancy was gone, 
uh, and a new era was, was coming about, uh, a large amount of Georgians switched their allegiance and came out openly for him in the presidential election of January 2004. And as I said, he got 96% of the vote. So the only way was down really after that. Uh, you can't maintain 96%. And it also meant that a lot of his support was quite shallow. It was based on unrealistic expectations, which he was never going to meet. And so you see throughout the last decade an erosion of that support. He barely scrapes in in the presidential elections of 2008. Uh, and these occurred after uh, violent demonstrations uh, on the streets of Tbilisi in November 2007. These were premature elections. Uh, his critics referred to his administration as one marked by liberal Bolshevism. In other words, that he was, it was liberal in its intentions, but Bolshevik in its means, that it was authoritarian and anti-dissent. Um, for a long time, there was no coordinated opposition in Georgia. That didn't mean that people were supremely happy. It meant that it was just difficult to organize. Uh, not in the Central Asian sense of the word, where you, know, you simply can't uh, really register a political party legally, an opposition party. But it was, it, was, it was very difficult to mobilize. Access to the media was very difficult. And that's why, as we'll see, when Bidzina, it took somebody like Bidzina Ivanishvili, a man who has huge resources, whose personal fortune is greater than that of the Georgian national budget, who's in the Forbes top 200 wealthiest men, personal fortune of 6.4 billion at last count. It took somebody like that with deep pockets to, you might say, uh, finance an opposition which could take on the administrative resources uh, that Saakashvili had at his disposal. Many people, before even Ashvili came onto the electoral scene, thought that uh, Saakashvili would, as they say, pull a Putin on it, uh, that he was more or less going to, he was changing the constitution. Now we're seeing Georgia shifting as of uh, next October, will shift to a parliamentary system where the prime minister will be the dominant figure. And they thought that this was being done, the constitution was being tailored so that Saakashvili would vacate the presidency in October and then become prime minister. Uh, and then he would have uh, a new lease of political life. You have to remember Saakashvili is only 45 years of age, despite being in power for almost a decade. You know, he's a man with a long life ahead of him. So many people suspected that. So this, if that was the plan, it didn't go according to plan. Um, and we're left with a new dispensation, uh, which is a first for Georgia, one of cohabitation, uh, where we have a president whose term of office expires in October, who is of one political party, uh, and uh, a real genuine rival who has, you might say, uh, the majority of the power now being prime minister. He doesn't have it formally yet, uh, because I said that the, the constitution changes only kick in after the presidential elections in uh, October, but de facto he has the power now in, in Georgia. He, ha he, he appoints the ministers, uh, he decides who will be ambassadors. For example, just, just today I read as I was coming in that Saakashvili recalled 12 ambassadors. Uh, that wasn't his choice. Uh, even Ashvili simply said, these are your guys, I want my guys, they're gonna go, and they're gone. Um, so more or less, Saakashvili remains president. He does have formal constitutional powers, which are quite impressive, but he's not going to utilize them because he knows that he's a parliament against him and it would be ultimately counterproductive. The next question really is, is, is who is Ivan Ashvili? I mean, if you were to ask this question a year before the elections, uh, very few people would have been able to tell you. Certainly there weren't even many photographs circulating on the internet. Um, and yet he had this huge mansion uh, on the hills of Georgia, something out of James Bond with a helicopter pad and stainless steel. Um, he was a reclusive philanthropist, uh, and that's how he was primarily known in Georgia, a man who helped renovate churches, who was from a small village, a self-made man who made billions in ways which we'll never probably fully divine in Russia in the 1990s, as did many people. Russia certainly was a place to make a lot of money very quickly in the 1990s. That in itself was used to imply, to heavily imply, that he was more or less um, a Russian stooge, that he was uh, a puppet of the Kremlin. And to be honest, no evidence was ever produced to verify that. Uh, if there was a smoking gun, I think it would have been produced. The, the state-run media had a year to come up with something solid. Other than that, he made a lot of money in Russia, which, again, a lot of people did in the early 1990s. Uh, he does have a lack of political experience. This is quite obvious. Uh, anybody who has uh, seen some of his press conferences, he uh, has often made statements which would be difficult to stand over, and he has withdrawn later and apologized for. There have been inconsistencies. He somewhat, he reminds me of, a, of the Ross Perot figure uh, of the early 1990s. You might remember in America who challenged George Bush Sr. and Bill Clinton, uh, and whose main kind of uh, election uh, point might have been 
I made a lot of money for myself. I can do the same for the nation. I'm a self-made man. You know, vote for somebody like me. Uh, Ross Perot got 20% in America, but he, uh, even Ashvili has now um, taken, you might say, Georgia. I have to confess, a lot of people in Georgia and outside of Georgia had mixed feelings about even Ashvili's candidacy. Uh, on the one hand, as I implied earlier, only somebody with even Ashvili's resources could have challenged Saakashvili. That's clear. <laughs> on the other hand, a man who has such immense personal wealth uh, conjures up the risk of state capture, you know, that essentially someone's buying a state when he has more money than the state coffers. Uh, and how, how do you prevent even a, a more authoritarian or potentially authoritarian figure developing who has not only the state resources but such huge personal resources uh, as well? Um, but his party, which he formed very, very quickly, George and Dream, is not really a party, it's more a coalition of six parties, many of whom have widely divergent objectives and political points of view and, and personalities. And as I, I would suggest, I guess, that it, it, its lifespan is not indefinite for sure. I think it will fragment over time. But the one thing that's going to keep it together in the foreseeable future is the fact that Saakashvili is still president. And if they fragment, they only make his life easier. And that UNM is still uh, a force in parliament. I mean, this is an important point to stress that Saakashvili's UNM may have been defeated, but they were not eliminated. Uh, they got 40% of the vote. That's not insubstantial. Um, and they still are a force in Parliament. They still are a force uh, in the country. Now, uh, when he um, put forward his candidacy, uh, well, actually, not his candidacy, but the candidacy of his party, uh, George and Dream, for the elections, uh, even Ashvili was immediately subjected to a lot of harassment. Uh, some of this may be familiar to, to some of you. Um, for example, his citizenship was taken from him uh, on a technicality. He had multiple citizenships. And technically, he should have uh, asked for his Georgian citizenship back. Uh, he should have given it back and then reapplied. Uh, he didn't do that, and because of that, it was taken from him. But it was very, very selective. Um, and they waited to the, you know, then he appealed, and they waited to the very last day of a three month appeal process to say that his appeal was unsuccessful. So, slowing down his, 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 his campaign, um, his, he was given multiple fines, uh, disproportionate to the crimes, alleged crimes, administrative crimes that were being committed, like, for example, spending too much money. Uh, on, on the campaign or receiving in-kind donations which were not declared. He was fined over $100 million uh, for these relatively small uh, administrative crimes. His, and when he refused to pay, his bank, which he owned in Georgia, Cartoo Bank, was seized from him. Eventually, he paid the fines. Um, but now that he's become prime minister, he's actually taken them back again. Um, so it's, it's, it's one of the virtues of being prime minister. He quite cleverly actually uh, paid the fines because there, were, there, was a, there was a natural disaster in Kaheti, a region in eastern Georgia, and he said, I'm paying the fines as long as the government gives the money that I am giving now to this disaster area, which put him in a wonderful position because if they did that, it would be considered even Ashvili's money, not the government money. And if he didn't do that, people in the region would say, well, why haven't you given us all this money? Well, even Ashvili said he's giving to you for us. So uh, it was a very good move. But a lot, a lot of harassment, a lot of obstacles placed in his way. Uh, he tried to establish a TV station, Global 9 TV. It in initially uh, received a lot of um, uh, obstacles. Uh, but the most important thing really was the very intensive campaign to discredit him, uh, his personality and his motives, uh, particularly uh, implying that he was more or less uh, fulfilling a Russian uh, plot in, in, in Georgia. Um, the interesting thing about the election campaign itself was that even though Saakashvili and Ivanishvili were the two names everybody was talking about, they were not contesting in this election. This was not a presidential election. This was a parliamentary election. Um, so... They, were, they essentially had proxies, and their proxies were their parties. Uh, even Ashvili's money was the glue that kept George and Dream together. Um, Saakashvili, of course, had the incumbency effect. He had the administrative resources. Uh, and now that uh, these two have accumulated a lot of bad blood, a lot of things were said and done during the election campaign, the real question is going to be whether they can <coughs> cohabit. But I want to show you just briefly the election results, if I can just move this a little bit forward. Uh, so there's the actual results itself. Uh, as you can see... The collective opposition increased their vote really from 17% to 54, 55%. United National Movement, which was, uh, is, is Saakashvili's party, decreasing from about 60 to 40%. Uh, so it's a very clear uh, erosion of UNM support. Um, but it's not, it's not, as I said, a, a, a catastrophic elimination either. It's not, for example, anything like Fianna Fáil suffered uh, in 2011. Um, 
the, the, what this election did, though, is it, it completely polarized Georgian society. None of the other parties got representation. There is a 5% threshold in Georgian elections, so if you don't get more than 5%, you don't get representation in Parliament. No other party except UNM and uh, Georgian Dream got representation in Parliament. Uh, the turnout was higher, significantly higher, in 2012. And there's the way the seats... Uh, turned out, 85 for uh, Georgian Dream, 65 for UNM. It's important to say as well that since then, some UNM majoritarian uh, deputies have switched sides. Um, rather opportunistically saying that they've now seen which way the people have voted, they have a duty to follow the people. <laughs> so <laughs> they, have, they have moved from UNM to Georgian Dream. There are generally people who are, as I said, not elected on the list system because Georgia has a mixed electoral system, half on the list, half, more or less half on the list, half uh, majoritarians. Those who are majoritarian tend to be self-made men in the regions, local notables. Uh, and they have more or less said that, well, we only gave our allegiance to UNM because they were the governing party, now we go with the new governing party. Uh, so UNM's support is now below 60. It's, they have an effective uh, control of about 50, 55, 56 deputies. Um, and there's how the, re the, the, the country voted. You'll, you'll notice that there's some quite you know, obvious... Uh, divisions in the way the country voted. In the south, southern part of Georgia, you notice that it mainly voted for UNM. Um, these are areas primarily populated by ethnic Armenians and ethnic Azeris. Uh, and they tended to always vote with whoever was in power. Like often minorities do. Their attitude is, we don't want to annoy the people who are in power. Also, they received some benefits uh, under, the, under the last uh, government. They, they did have quite a, a strong policy of encouraging an, uh, a civic concept of citizenship and nation, nationality rather than an ethnic one. So the Armenians and the Azeris, as they had done for Shevard Nadze in his time, they delivered the vote for, for UNM. Uh, also, in the west of Georgia, those closest to uh, Abkhazia, uh, you tend to find, again, strong UNM support, primarily because of the fact that many people uh, appreciated development in the area, but also Sakishvili's strong line on Abkhazia uh, and on, 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 on South Ossetia was appreciated uh, by many uh, there. But some surprising votes. I mean, Kutaisi, for example, where the parliament is supposed to be moved to, uh, voted against the government. Uh, Batumi, which was the showpiece for the UNM government. Uh, so much money was put into the Radisson hotels, Marriott's, uh, Trump Towers. Uh, this was supposed to be the, the kind of the showpiece, an international airport established there, and they voted against UNM. Uh, you might ask, why uh, do these regions, which receive so much investment, uh, vote against the government? And having gone to these regions and spoken to, to a lot of people, I guess I would say uh, primarily because people didn't feel they were benefiting from the investment. Uh, if you take Batumi, for example, it's, it's right beside Turkey. It used to be part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, a lot of people feel that a lot of this Turkish money that's come in has not benefited locally, locals, that uh, Turkish citizens are in a stronger position than, than, than Georgian ones. So there's a certain... Uh, certain xenophobia, certain localism uh, that has developed there uh, against you know, outside investment. A lot of the jobs that were in the construction industry weren't given to Georgians, it's felt. Uh, so some surprises, uh, as you can see from the electoral map. But, um, and Tbilisi. If you look at the, uh, in the corner there, you'll see Tbilisi. Uh, all blue, all Georgian dream. And this is one of the key features of the election. Those who were uh, urbanized, those who were you know, higher than average education, higher than average salary, they actually tended to vote against UNM uh, in, in, in greater numbers, uh, which means that UNM was doing more or less what Shepard Nancy was doing, of course, not to the same extent, uh, at the end of his time in office, where he was um, relying on votes that could be easily delivered um, by, again, local governors, rather than actually appealing intellectually or to the, 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 um, the, the, the minds of the people. Uh, so Tbilisi, which is the most, the most urbanized, uh, disproportionately uh, strong in terms of population. I mean, it's, it's, it's like Dublin, really, in terms of its, its relationship with the rest of the country. So if you lose Dublin, you're in trouble. If you lose Tbilisi, you're very much in trouble in Georgia. And they didn't get, as you see, one single seat uh, in Tbilisi. Now, uh, I know the time is moving along, and uh, I have... No problem. No problem. Okay. Um, that's good to hear. Um, I ju just the next point I had to make there, if I go back, was why did UNM lose? Um, yes, why did UNM lose? And I, I phrase it that way because I think it's, a, it's an old truism that oppositions don't uh, win elections, governments lose them. 
you know, they, they have the, the initiative, and certainly in Georgia where the government had control of the state TV, administrative resources, the question is what went wrong. Now, I've spoken to UNM representatives um, about this, and generally they come up with three factors. Uh, they say um, even Ashvili's money was decisive. Uh, the role of the Georgian Orthodox Church, uh, which has a position similar to what perhaps the Catholic Church had here until the 1980s or 1990s, um, and what you might call those prison videos. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with this story, about 10 days before the election, uh, videos were uploaded onto the internet and shown on state uh, and national television, um, which uh, showed torture uh, in the prison system. Uh, and in, 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 there were some particularly graphic images that were shown, um, and one uh, with a broomstick. And I, I mention that because the, the broomstick became then a symbol of the opposition. You had lots of people going to the streets with broomsticks. I won't go into detail of what was done with the broomstick, but you, you, can, you don't let your mind even go there. Um, but the thing is, is that it, it swung the electorate, uh, certainly, a, a certain degree of the electorate in those last 10 days. Now, these videos had been taken in May, so the fact that they were released just before the elections means that somebody has a political plan with these videos. And there's all sorts of conspiracy theories. Um, but the point I would make is this, is that if that's the lesson that UNM take away from this election, that it was just the prison videos that stole the election from them, and they point to very favorable opinion polls in August where they, it showed that they were way ahead, um, that it was the videos and even Ishvili's money, uh, that was really what did it for them, I think that would be a mistake. Um, I think it would insulate them from much deeper uh, criticisms and perhaps postpone the necessary introspection which all parties need to go through when they lose an election. <coughs> Even Ashfili's money allowed him to compete, but it didn't buy the election. I mean, the government had enough administrative resources. As I said, they fined him on multiple occasions when he moved a little bit outside the boundaries, allegedly. Um, he, couldn't, he couldn't just throw money at the election. Uh, it was much deeper than that. And those prison videos, uh, again, they fed into a much larger discontent regarding the judicial system uh, and about arbitrary arrests. Georgia, for example, has the highest uh, per capita prison population in Europe. Uh, it's one of the top five in the world. Uh, again, as I said, the same population as Ireland, more or less. Ireland has approximately, I think, 3,000 prisoners. Uh, Georgia, 24,000. Uh, now imagine, Georgia's sense of family is, 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 is much stronger, actually, than, than, than that in Ireland. You have one person in prison, one family member, that's 10 or 12 at least people who are intimately interested in the fate of that prisoner. That's a huge chunk of the electorate. You know, you're talking at least about three, 400,000 people who know somebody very close to them, family member who's in prison. Uh, you can't underestimate the effect that that has on individual uh, constituencies. Um, so I think that, you know, if that's the lesson, as I said, that would be a mistake. There were much deeper um, problems that people had. And ultimately, as, as I mentioned before, the, the smears didn't stick. They, all these initiatives that were being taken against Ivan uh, the, 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 the the allegation that he was essentially working for Russia, they, they didn't ultimately get traction or sufficient traction for most people to believe that they were taking a huge gamble geopolitically by voting for Ivan He had far too many uh, known pro-Western, liberal-orientated people on his campaign team, people like Iraqi Alassani, uh, for example, uh, to, to kind of make that a credible uh, accusation. <coughs> And as one person put it to me, now, now in the Georgian Dream government, uh, they put it quite well. They said when they saw the, the prison videos, it wasn't that they really criticized the government so much. They were criticizing themselves because deep down most people knew these kinds of things were happening in the prison system. And it was kind of, they were rebuking themselves and saying, the only thing I can do to, to change this, I've been quiet about it, I've, I've closed my eyes, is to go out and vote uh, for, for an alternative. So... Again, it's, it's, um, it's not as simple as money and videos uh, in terms of losing the election. And also you have to add into the fact that uh, after nine years in power, there's a natural desire for change. And, and uh, you know, the fact that even Ashvili had been behind so many philanthropic um, uh, endeavors in Georgia also uh, made him very popular. I mean, you know, Georgia is a, a political environment where you have larger than life figures. Uh, it, it, some might argue that there's almost a messiah complex. The leader has to be somebody who's going to revolutionize society, to change society. This always leads to the cycle of revolutions as well, where you get these dashed expectations. This romantic figure comes onto the scene saying he's going to solve all the problems, and then within a decade, uh, all those uh, great expectations have been dashed, and, and you end up in that cycle that I mentioned uh, at the very beginning. So 
where do we go from here? Um, I'll, I'll move on to the what next section, if I may. But before that, I'll just go. I had one or two more slides that I hadn't shown, and they illustrate a story. Uh, firstly, the most important issues in the elections. Um, this is from uh, a poll, uh, several polls conducted by the National Democratic Institute uh, in Georgia, uh, which is the, you might say, foreign policy wing of the Democratic Party in the United States. Uh, they do wonderful polls conducted by uh, the CRRC, the Cox's uh, Resource Research Center. And here, you, people are being asked simply what are the most important electoral issues for them. Most of them would also apply to Ireland. Jobs and affordable health care certainly would be up there. But look at territorial integrity. It's number three. Um, you know, the issues of Abkhazia, of South Ossetia, uh, which the Georgian government has for quite some time now been going around the world saying are occupied territories occupied by Russia. The, this is still a very salient issue uh, with the electorate. Um, relations with Russia, you can add to that territorial integrity. They're intimately linked. So about half the electorate are very much concerned about relations with Russia or, and or territorial integrity. Um, the other issue I wanted to raise here is how the election was perceived abroad. Look at this. From the Wall Street Journal, a Russian victory in Georgia's parliamentary election. Billionaire winner Bidzina Ivanishvili owes his wealth to the Putin regime in Moscow. Um, very effective lobbying, I think, was behind such headlines very quickly uh, after the election. Um, so, you know, there's now, I think, a more nuanced appreciation that this is not a Russian victory in Georgia. This government is just as geopolitically uh, committed, at least rhetorically. Time will only tell how committed they are, but rhetorically, they're just as committed to uh, membership of NATO, membership of the European Union, and uh, they're going to try and square that circle of balancing relations with Russia. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is, yes, this tale of two surveys. This says a lot. Here's what, by the way, I, those of you that don't already know this, uh, best website for news on Georgia, it comes out daily, uh, civil.ge. Um, and here is a story from August. It's the NDI poll showing UNM in a strong lead. Now, this is the poll that UNM looked to and say, this is why we lost the election because of the videos. We were well ahead in August. Um, and then you see... Um, this, this shows you the bandwagoning in Georgia. Here's the same organization conducting the same type of poll, again, 3,000 res, uh, respondents in November, which shows NDI poll, uh, shows strong support for Georgian Dream. And Georgian Dream now has 63%, whereas it had 14% in August. How can we explain this? The one thing that NDI didn't really pick up on, and international observers, and a lot of people in Georgia, was how many people refused to ask, answer the survey uh, requests. Because uh, these are these are person-to-person -person surveys, so there are people are being stopped in the street and asked, or going into people's houses and being asked. Forty-six percent didn't answer the question; they refused to answer. And therein lies the story. Why would forty? Well, why would almost half the population say, "I'm not answering your question about who I'm going to vote for"? I mean, it, it, we've seen polls conducted by MRBI and Paddy Power and whatnot. You get, you always get a small percentage who are, you know, for whatever reasons, uh, unable or unwilling to reply. But forty-six percent is huge. Uh, and that was something that was not picked up. But a lot of people were, were going to vote for George and Dream who weren't going to tell a stranger that they were going to vote for George and Dream. Um, the other thing as well is, is what I refer to as the bandwagon effect of Georgian politics. Uh, a lot of people, once they saw the wind was blowing towards George and Dream, once they've won the election, now they're openly declaring that they were always George and Dream people. And that's, it's the same as what happened with Saakashvili really in 2003. Why he got that 96%? Uh, it was because people knew he was already the man. And now that people know that Ivanishvili is the man, you see a huge amount of opinion moving in that uh, direction. Now, the real question that we are left with in the, in the remaining part, uh, which will be very brief, is what next? And then we can, we can talk about the challenges in the, um, in the questions and answers sessions, I hope. Um, what next? Will this uh, Georgian Dream uh, coalition stick together? As I suggested, um, it's, it's deeply fragmented, it's ideologically incoherent, uh, it doesn't have a natural uh, cohesion. However, Saakashvili's presidency will be the glue that will keep it together for the next few months. After that, it may be good if the party splits um, into different factions, because what Georgia ultimately needs, I think, is a multi-party democracy. Again, breaking the cycle of this you know, catch-all hegemonic party that emerges after elections, which is usually established just before elections, which wins, sweeps the board, uh, everything before it is eliminated, and then has hegemonic power for a decade, and then is completely dissolved with no trace left behind and replaced by another hegemonic party. A multi-party democracy would be befitting a country which is now moving towards a parliamentary system. So if George and Dream 
could ease its way into somehow fragmenting peacefully into nice factions, it would be, it would be very nice. Um, and I think it will happen anyway. At least the smaller constituent parts will break away because of the fact that, that I said they're ideologically, I think, um, uh, incompatible. Um, what will happen to UNM? Um, this is another question. Will they be able to uh, attract supporters now that they have no power, since so much of their support was based on you know, jobs that they were giving in the civil service, investment in certain regions? They now have nothing in their gift to give. Is their brand strong enough to retain that 40% who voted for them in the election? Um, a lot will depend, of course, on how they perform in opposition. A lot will, prefer, will depend on how uh, Georgian Dream performs. Uh, as I said, expectations are extremely high. And they're already being disappointed. Um, for example, uh, there were promises made in the election of utility tariffs being uh, cut in half, like electricity bills, which are, are high for most Georgian citizens. Uh, that's now being said it can't be done. They've reduced it by a small amount, but nothing like half. Uh, same with petrol prices. Again, they were promised huge reductions. Even Ashvili also said that he was going to step down within two years. Uh, of, more or less, he was saying, let me be a tool in your hands, you the electorate. Uh, and I will break down this authoritarian dictatorship, and I will then hand over power to the people. We've heard that story, I guess, in different parts of the world. Now he's saying that he'll only step down when his work is done, which is rather open-ended. Um, and that's, that is not something that has disillusioned people immediately, but I think as time goes on, it may add to the reasons why people might be uh, disillusioned. Um, I think, though, he's probably realized that if he did leave too soon, Georgian Dream would completely fragment. And his, his money, as I said, which is a large part of what keeps it together, uh, would, would, would also accelerate uh, an unhealthy uh, fragmentation of, of, um, of the party, of the coalition. We also have to ask ourselves, what happens to Saakashvili after October? He's not going to stand for the presidency, obviously. He's only 45 years of age. Uh, he'll be 46 next December. Um, you know, what's he going to do? Um, is he going to stay in Georgian politics, uh, and how will he be perceived um, by um, the Georgian electorate if, if, if he does? Um, I should also mention as well, I, I'm sorry that I, I, I didn't mention this, that he, he has been very critical of the, the wave of arrests that have occurred in Georgia after this election. And this is a question we can take on in the questions and answers session about whether this is selective justice or is this as some in the government would now maintain natural justice. Um, this is a big question. And he's been very critical also of the release of political prisoners who he deems not political. That's another question we can look at afterwards. Um, but he's still very active. Um, he's still an active president, but he's a lame duck president, very much so, with only a few months to go, and still, as I said, uh, a very young man. The other question, of course, that people are probably interested in is, will this mean anything about Georgia's geopolitical direction? Uh, is it you know, something that will bring Georgia into closer relations with Russia? Is it something that will somehow uh, scupper um, uh, attempts to join NATO or the European Union? As I said, I, I, I've met with um, different uh, people in the Georgian government, the new Georgian government, during the last couple of months. There's nothing in what they say, at least officially, that indicates there's any change on fundamentals. Um, however, they're left with this circle to square, which no previous Georgia government has been able to do, how to reconcile a geopolitical orientation that is very pro-Western with good relations with Russia. Uh, because, and I think this will become obvious to those who are Georgia watchers over the next months and years, is that the problem, despite the rhetoric that came out of the Kremlin occasionally, the problem was never really Saakashvili. The problem never really was uh, the United National Movement. The problem was Georgia's geopolitical orientation. Because Shevardnadze encountered the same troubles, those of you that remember, we'll say 2002, uh, 2001, there were bombings of Georgia in the Pankisi Gorge region, because why? Shevardnadze had said that Georgia would be knocking on NATO's door in 2005. Um, you know, it, the problem is one of geopolitical orientation. Uh, the, the problem is Russia's inability, ultimately, to accept Georgia as a sovereign entity which has a right to decide its geopolitical destiny, um, which is natural for post-colonial situations. It's not, it's not unusual, and certainly would be familiar, perhaps, if you look at 1920s and 30s Irish history, when people like Winston Churchill had very big difficulties in, 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 uh, in reconciling his idea of what Ireland was with uh, the fact that it was now uh, a separate uh, independent state. Um, I may finish uh, on that note, because I, I, I notice that I've definitely gone over time, um, and I'm sure there are lots of questions, and uh, it seems like relations with Russia seems like a good place to call Line. I don't want to inform the discussions. <laughs>